to our Upbuild Conversations. Today, we're happy to have the full team together, and we are looking at what does it mean to be self-aware? What does it mean to be self-aware? It's a thread throughout our work, self-awareness. It's one of our core principles, and it's absolutely critical as a leader to be aware of ourselves to know what we're bringing to the table, what we're bringing into our organizations, into our systems, into our lives. And um, we often encounter that many people that we meet have this little expression. I have used this myself. I'm a pretty self-aware person. <laughs> I'm a pretty self-aware person. You, you've probably encountered that before also. Uh, what does that mean? It, it, it begs a lot of questions. How can you really be a pretty self-aware person? And, and we want to examine that more and perhaps push on that idea a bit. So I wanted to throw it to you guys uh, for, for anything that comes to you about the idea of being self-aware and, and this sense of like, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty self-aware. <clears throat> Thank you, Harry Prasad. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll jump in first. <laughs> it, it brings to mind the same thing that I shared during the workshops about uh, the, what my economics professor talks about average drivers. And he says how uh, 80% of the drivers feel that they're above, above average, which is a statistical impossibility. Um, self-awareness is something uh, similar. I also think that the question of self-awareness brings, um, brings up certain emotions of shame. The fact that I'm not self-aware um, makes me experience uh, some element of shame. So I always want to, and in, in terms of how I project myself, um, I always want to uh, know that I'm self-aware. Um, but then deep down, I also understand subconsciously that to be self-aware means a lot of inner work <laughs> that I sometimes don't have the muscles for or don't have the time for um, or also not being trained to, to do. So in the absence of all of that, and then the experience of quote unquote shame for not being self-aware, uh, many times there's the tendency to say, you know, I think I'm a pretty self-aware person. And that gives us, and how can you debate that, right? <laughs> how can you, well, prove to me. <laughs> uh, it's a, it's a, it, it's, it can be a very difficult, and even hard to actually prove because it's such a subjective experience. But again, I don't think it is necessarily so subjective because other people around can some experience somebody's blind spots. Uh, other people around can also experience how someone is not self-aware. And when it, the, the times that it gets really difficult, and we have seen this even in our coaching work, is uh, when the person is not self-aware, but actually thinks that, that he's extremely self-aware, that is the place where you just really can get any leverage on, uh, on making movements on growth. Uh, that to me is, uh, has been the most challenging component of, uh, of the coaching is uh, when the feedback is very substantially uh, pointing to the fact that the person is not very self-aware, but the person basically dismisses <laughs> Uh, all the feedback because hey, this feedback has to be incorrect because I'm pretty self-aware and I know what's happening. <laughs> so that's the dichotomy. <laughs> There's kind of like a, a, a built-in mechanism to make this the case. Whereas in like something like sports, you know, it's pretty easy to see if somebody's a professional athlete, that that person is way better than me in this particular area. But if you're talking about self-awareness and the conversation is even coming up like that might, that's enough for most people. It certainly is for me as well. 
a lot of times that if, if I'm even broaching the topic or if I'm even getting coaching in the first place, if I've signed up for coaching or I've signed up for a self-awareness workshop, that is enough to, you know, kind of check the box. I get a gold star. I'm, I'm self-aware. <laughs> And, and on the, that idea of shame, you know, that how many people really, really like to say, oh, my God, I totally missed that. I mean, it, and there may be times where we laugh about that. Oh, man, I totally missed that. But that's when we feel comfortable and secure, generally comfortable by saying, like, you know, I'm admitting it and, like, make a joke out of it. But the thing is, when we really miss something that we feel we should have seen, it brings up a lot of vulnerability. And that vulnerability is because of the shame. So the idea of like, I don't know myself very well, that starts to get m deeper, more shameful. So I have to compensate for that by being self-aware. But the question is, am I really self-aware? How do I know I'm self-aware? And, and, and the... Is that the place I want to be coming from, compensating for my shame? Do I want to be self-aware so that I don't feel the shame and can hide it? Right? Is that an act of self-awareness? The um, I was going to say in response to what you just said, Hari Prasad, that um, uh, the 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 notion of uh, it's the notion of self awareness is very akin to what we talk about uh, or at least paraphrase uh, Thomas Merton's uh, take on humility that it's a uh, it's a self protecting humility is a self protecting virtue you can't be you can be happy about the fact that you're humble because the moment you do that you you lose the virtue itself you lose humility. Um, I think self-awareness and, and many virtues that are that run very deep uh, have a very similar quality. Self-awareness is something very similar. As soon as we say, oh, I'm a very self-aware person, I think right at that point in time, I lose my capacity to see what I'm not aware of. <laughs> um, it's, it's so, uh, it's paradoxical. Um, so somebody who is very deeply self-aware uh, or I, I would say the single trait of someone who's actually very deeply self-aware is somebody who's constantly saying, well, I'm not really aware of what I, what I can see. So uh, it's almost like somebody who is, who is very deeply self-aware is always saying, well, I'm not self-aware. And so I have to be looking, I have to be looking harder. You know, I think also what's, what's interesting is Usually we need someone or some framework to show that to us because I, I mean, when you first, when you opened this conversation, Hari Prasad, I was thinking about my, like, that phrase has been with me since high school. I definitely thought that or have expressed it to people as early as high school. And I think we live within our thoughts, right? And so we're familiar with them. And by virtue of that, we think like, oh, I have awareness. I have self-awareness. And so for me, you know, it was, and I've pretty much believed that all of my life. And then I think the Enneagram kind of shook me into a different level of awareness. It's kind of, I share the story sometimes around levels of consciousness, which is really levels of awareness and how the first time I went through the workshop that we teach, I thought that I was at a pretty high level of awareness, a high level of consciousness. And with each subsequent time through, I found myself descending in, in uh, my level of consciousness. And part of that is someone showing you all of the things that you are unaware of. And then yes, being able to acknowledge and accept those things. But I think without that external source of show, helping you see some of those blind spots. It's, I think it's natural that we think we live within our thoughts and we're familiar with them. And so that breeds a sort of feeling of self-awareness. Yeah. And it also, uh, um, it's also hard to walk around the world 
um, feeling like, well, I don't know anything about myself. Uh, like, where is the confidence to navigate the world? Um, what do I really trust then if I, if I think I'm not self-aware? Um, so we do need some element of knowing that, you know, I can, I, I think I understand myself. Um, and uh, then it's a question of how far we take it. Um, it's a question of, uh, well, does that mean that I'm exempt from not having to look at things? Um, that, uh, that I need to be even actively searching for to look, to look at. And uh, I think the world is a very good mirror. It shows us um, what we need to look at um, through our relationships, primarily, um, through relationships that are pretty close to us. Um, we, yeah, we, we are forced to confront uh, things that we need to look at more deeply, uh, even when there is uh, ample justification for it. Um, so it's a very fine balance of uh, trusting that you can see, and then also distrusting what you are seeing. And being able to carry both of them together, it's, it's opposite ideas, but being able to, being comfortable with the fact that both of them simultaneously exist. The world also, it, yeah, it's, it's a good mirror for bringing us in touch with things that we're not aware of. It's also a, a way in which we feel expected to know, right? The world expects us to know what we're doing and we feel like in order to fit into this world and to be okay and secure in the world, that I need to be aware and I need to, it, even if I'm not aware, I need to pretend like I am. Fake it till you make it, right? Confidence is everything. Just pump yourself up. You can do it. You like, you don't have to be aware of everything. If you're aware of enough, you can make like you're aware of everything and you'll get on great because nobody's really aware of anything anyway. So I am pretty self-aware. I think this is what makes it so difficult for leaders often to have self-awareness is, is that even though they might have the psychological safety to be vulnerable and actually express when they you know, can see their blind spots and maybe not always know. Uh, they also don't necessarily get that feedback and that mirror as often as other people because there's nobody at their level. There's nobody who might feel comfortable to actually say, hey, you're, you're missing something here. You're actually not seeing the whole picture. And so, you know, it can feel quite lonely at the top sometimes. Yeah, we're afraid to ask for help and people are afraid to give us help. Also, uh, many times the feedback that's given is uh, also, um, it doesn't necessarily fully understand the person that we're giving feedback to. So it may come from somebody's subjective experience. And I'm not, I'm, this is not to invalidate that feedback. Uh, and many times the feedback, when it comes from a place that's subjective, perhaps even like charged without necessarily understanding the perspective of the leader, then uh, the leader also feels misunderstood. <laughs> and so at that point in time, it's very easy to, to silo oneself and say, well, nobody really fully understands me. And while there is truth to it, uh, it can also become a zone of uh, isolation. Um, and it happens very silently uh, because to express that, well, I'm not fully understood is also a big part of vulnerability. Uh, and where can the leader actually go to show that vulnerability? It's, um, it's, it's not necessarily well received because a leader needs to be strong at every single point in time. There is a, there's the expectation that a leader shows up uh, strong at every single point in time. Um, so it does make, and you, you bring up a, a very, very powerful point, that it does make uh, it very difficult for a leader, and especially in a leadership position where there are numerous complexities, 
and uh, uh, there may be many where I am not, where I, I as a leader may not be fully equipped to deal with those complexities and I don't know where to go to be able to open up about it. So what should we do if, if we're leaders facing that dilemma? What should we do? I mean, I think the first thing is to become aware of that dilemma. I think most of the time we're not even aware that that is the dilemma that we're facing. But then what? Let's say we can recognize, yeah, you know what? I'm not able to ask for help. I'm not able to say I feel misunderstood. I'm not able to really express the vulnerability at all. Um, but I recognize it. Then what? Uh, well, I, I do think there is a growing recognition among uh, leaders uh, that that's why coaching is very helpful or having someone in the team. So there are, there are multiple ways in which this, uh, this dilemma can actually be practically tackled with. Um, one is having, having someone like a coach or a confidant who uh, you can go to um, to be very honest um, and be able to share uh, things and seek perspective. Um, we also see, uh, and this is something that I hear often, that there are CEO circles where um, CEOs, as uh, because the the functionality and the complexity that um, that arise um, uh, leads the CEOs to be able to understand each other's positions better. Uh, it creates a safe space to be able to, it's almost like, well, this is a level playing field. And I think we all can share freely uh, what we go through. Um, again, cre creating a peer support structure like that, um, where again, I think the culture needs to be honest sharing and not just like um, giving advice to other CEOs about what I do, but just being able to like honestly share what, uh, what I go through can be powerful. Um, and I think a third, a third component here would be um, your executive team. Uh, and many times the executive team is seen more as, uh, as, as a team that runs with the orders of the, of the CEO. Uh, but the executive team I think is, is a, is a real, uh, like they are confidants of the CEO. And if there is a mature executive team, and I, I, I underscore the word mature, uh, if there is a mature executive team, then uh, there is a lot of protection that the CEO gets in that team from a point of view of being able to share um, his or her vulnerabilities and, and seek perspective. I, the other question that's coming up for me right now is thinking about for a leader, all of the different character traits that they need to work on. Um, how important is self-awareness among all of those things? Where does it fall? Because the, the, there's a, all, almost an overwhelming number of things that they need to consider and take on. And so I'm really curious for your guys' views on, on this, like where does it fall in the list of things that I need to do? It's foundational. I mean, it's, it's the key and it, it unlocks the ability to work on other things. If we don't know the you are here point on the map, how are you gonna get anywhere else? It's impossible. So when we're fancying we're somewhere that we're not, this is what creates the greatest disconnect amongst teams, amongst families, like, I mean, this applies in all circumstances. The most awkward elephant in the room is when I think I'm so great at something and I'm really not, or I think I understand something <clears throat> and I'm actually misleading people or I'm misleading, I'm deceiving myself. So it starts with the you are here point. I mean, that is as foundational as it gets. And from there, we can see what we need to work on. We can see what it will take to work on it. And we can keep accountability with ourselves and hopefully have someone like a coach or, or other people in our lives that we can trust who hold us accountable. I mean, I'm reminded, Vipin, of an article that you had sent me years ago, which impacted me deeply and which um, we also have um, integrated into some of our work from Daniel Goleman uh, on emotional intelligence. And, and the title of the article 
uh, in the Harvard Business Review being what makes a leader. And it's not even what makes a good leader. I, I, I found this very poignant. It's what makes a leader, period. If you wanna be good, then you gotta really work on this, right? And the first thing, the first component, he gives five uh, aspects or components of leadership, which all tie to emotional intelligence. They're all, they make up emotional intelligence. And so his argument is that if we wanna be a leader, it means we're synonymous that's synonymous with emotionally intelligent. And what makes up emotional intelligence? The first thing is self-awareness, the very first thing. And we always hammer that home in our work and in our workshops because there's just nothing more important as a starting point and frankly, as an ending point. Also uh, to that point, uh, like you said, and within um, the, uh, it's like when an athlete is performing or expected to perform at the highest level. It's not that the athlete gets there and then says, okay, now that I'm at the highest level, I start working on certain muscles. The fact that you're aiming to actually play at the highest level requires for you to train those muscles very, very early on, even before you actually reach And then you start training for your muscles. Then you start training to build your muscles. It, it, it really doesn't work. Um, so uh, to me, self-awareness is, uh, is a characteristic that even before, way before you actually acquire some sort of leadership position, um, you, you actually very actively start working on. Um, because then when you get there, uh, you, uh, you continue working on it. It becomes even more of a responsibility to continue working on it. But because the muscles have been exercised uh, and built, um, it's so much easier to keep working on it when, when you do get to that position. Otherwise, going back to your point, um, it's overwhelming because the amount of responsibilities that you have in a leadership position are very significant. And then to then do the self-awareness work or start on the self-awareness work at that point, uh, it makes it even more difficult, almost like, you know what, this is just too difficult. I just don't want to do it. I'll rather, I'd rather continue being how I was and get wherever I can. Um, and that, that just creates more problems. So, so another follow on question that's coming up for me related to this, if we take the metaphor of the map and the you are here on the map, it's a very two dimensional preci with precision, I can say, I know I'm exactly here. So when we take that metaphor to self awareness and we think, okay, Hari Prasad, you said, I have to know where I am to know where I need to get to. But what are the elements here that we're talking about? Because it's not, we're not in a you can't precisely point to you are here in self-awareness. So how do we even bound this concept so that like, what are the elements I need to think about in terms of my self-awareness? Michael, also anyone who I'm curious for your thoughts on this, because it's such an amorphous topic in some ways, right? I, mean, I have, I have something that's been in my mind for, for a little while now. Uh, I don't know if this is, going to help with the matter. It might make things more confusing and overwhelming, but I'll just, I'll just say it for a moment and we can see where it goes. Well, we can make it messier before we clean it up. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. That's great. So, so to make it really messy, um, <laughs> I mean, before we talk about the components of self-awareness and, and how to bound that, we have to first think about, well, what am I aware of? I mean, we say self-awareness, that implies I'm aware of the self. Does that mean that like, I'm whoever, I, I'm aware of whoever I think I should be? I'm, I, I am my ego, as we define it, who I think I should be. And I'm really aware that that's what I am. I mean, in some sense, yes. Like we wanna be aware 
because we need to be aware of the masks that we wear. But we also have to be aware that those masks are not us. So when we talk about self-awareness, we're looking to actually peel the layers of the ego and to get beyond who we think we should be, who our parents you know, indoctrinated us to be, who our team expects us to be, who we've always dreamed of being since we were little kids, because that would be awesome. Who we actually are is something very, very, very different. So when we want to be aware of ourselves, we need to see what's getting in the way. And that is the ego. There are so many layers, so many masks. I don't think that got too messy. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's also the cornerstone of our work. That's, uh, we want to be who we really are, not our egos, not who we think we should be. Um, I also, in my own experience, um, and going back to the earlier point about uh, self-awareness, um, I also, although I have never explicitly um, stated growing up and growing up in India, self-awareness was not such a big thing talked about. Uh, so we didn't really explicitly talk about it, but um, <laughs> I felt like I was a, I was a pretty self-aware person. At least I portrayed it in other ways that I, I know myself and I know other people. Um, until it got to a point where um, uh, I had to really, I, I had to own the fact that I have insecurities. And to me, this is the, uh, and many times we generalize it and we say, well, I know I have insecurities. And just the fact, and just the way in which we express it indicates the degree to which we are self-aware. When you know you have insecurities, it's not a small thing. When you really know you have insecurities and the form that they take, um, it's a stark reality. The experience of that gravity um, and the sense of responsibility that comes with that is very different than just saying, well, I know I have a few insecurities. Uh, so to me, the single easiest point you are here, starting point, is to actually make a list of things that I'm insecure about. And, and how is it impacting other people? How is it impacting my decision? Um, how is it impacting the way I show up on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, and we can walk through that list. And, and if we pay a little attention, we will see that it's showing up and it's showing up very often. And that is uh, that in of itself, going through that experience in of itself can create that gravity. So uh, to me, uh, that is something that I, um, that I experienced and still continue to experience. Like yesterday, I had an experience of rage. I never, I've never, I've never uh, seen myself as an angry person, but I had a very strong experience of rage yesterday. Um, and it's almost, it's frightening to see that I have so much anger in me. Um, and it just changes the course of how you carry yourself. Uh, initially, there is, uh, there is a sense of like, wow, this is, uh, I don't like what I see. I don't like. I don't like myself. But then, as you process it, you also begin to experience a, uh, a deeper sense of humility. Um, there, you, uh, you know, there is a correction, <laughs> and that correction is a good correction, because now, when um, when you conduct yourself. Uh, you are, you are perhaps a little more aware that there are things within you that show up unexpectedly, that you really need to look at it. There is a certain gravity that comes with it. Um, so to me, the easiest starting point is really looking for your insecurities. Yeah, that's a, it's a very concrete, actually it's a very concrete way to establish that you, you are here on, on the map. And also, what you said reminds me of um, this Wayne Dyer's quote about when you're talking about the rage, like he talks about the orange and when the orange gets squeezed, what comes out is the juice and that's what's inside. So being able to acknowledge that these emotions that I'm feeling, that's what's inside of me. So I have to look at that 
closely um, because it's so easy to point your finger. Well, that other thing outside of me caused this, this reaction, this feeling. And so I distanced myself from it versus owning that whatever event that might have been the trigger, the reaction was mine. Um, and, and that was something that I have to be more conscious of. I also think the other thing that you said about insecurity, it's funny because like, you know, finding yourself on the map and the list of insecurities, I think we use that word quite comfortably and frequently in our environment. But then I, and, and um, it's almost a, it, it can be even, I would use the word exhilarating to discover new insecurities that we were unaware of. Um, and maybe because it's pointing to like, it's like finding pieces of a puzzle to yourself that we had lost somewhere. But then I also think about so many times we've talked about, you know, doing workshops with organizations. And as we talk about some of the frameworks that we want to bring to help cultivate more self-awareness, if we talk too much about insecurities, I think sometimes we can get a reaction. It's almost like, well, that sounds really depressing. Let's do something more up <laughs> uplifting. <laughs> and so, you know, it's all, again, it's the eye of the beholder. It's very uplifting for us because to, to, to discover something that was, you were blind to before is, it can, can be really uplifting, but we also have such um, conditioned, uh, you know, relationships with the, the idea of insecurity that it's, it's very difficult to look at. It's also how are you going to create security? How are you going to get the uplifting effect without looking at the blocks to it? The insecurity, the lack of security is what's stopping me from feeling uplifted. Now, if I want to pretend to be uplifted or pump myself up, that's another thing. But when we want grounded, real, powerful upliftment, it means it has to be resting on something solid and we don't want to be avoidant. I mean, who wants to be an avoidant leader? Who likes an avoidant leader? But we don't talk in these terms. So when we talk about, yeah, that sounds depressing. Well, we could reframe that as that may sound avoidant. Also, also, um, I think the excitement, as you put it, within uh, uh, the the excitement is in the discovery. So, if uh, if I'm going into a conversation like that, not necessarily wanting to discover, but uh, wanting to feel good, uh, then uh, then that's essentially what I you know what I look for is just wanting to feel good. But discovery has, and this is what Amy Vinson um, talks about in her book, Teaming. Um, and when she talks about a learning organization, the, the primary focus of a learning organization is discovery. How fast can we, can we discover things about ourselves? Um, and when we hit those places and we have those learnings, then naturally the response to that is becoming better. But uh, her, her whole point is if we do not have the mindset of learning and discovery, uh, but instead have the mindset of proving, then we end up making more mistakes and we actually fail more uh, because the mindset is one of proving. So uh, this is, uh, even on a very personal level, when we learn to live life as a discovery. Uh, yes, true, there will be moments of discovery that will be unpleasant, but um, it's, it's, it's freeing when we discover. <laughs> Um, and it also benefits other people. And we know so, what it's like. Sorry. Michael, so go, going back to the map metaphor, um, we really have to know that we're not at the destination or we have to know that we have to know that we don't know what the destination is because too often we actually have the destination in mind. We have, we have labels for the destination. So for example, your anger example. Um, if my destination is I'm not an angry person, even though all of my behavior might disprove that, I'm still gonna justify it. I'm still gonna come up with lots of good reasons 
why I got angry and that it's okay and that next time it won't happen because I'm a self-aware person. So we, we have the destination in mind and therefore it prevents that learning that you're talking about. If, and this goes back to being attached to an identity um, that uh, we portray to the world and uh, we also um, we also feel good about ourselves, and this is the this is the this is the amazing thing about life. Uh, there are periods of life that actually affirm a theory that we have about ourselves. Uh, I am successful. I am kind. I am uh, um, I am righteous, um, and. Uh, uh, and then suddenly there are periods of life that just like tear that notion down. <laughs> and we are left wondering, well, what happened? Like, what happened here? Right? So, and then we begin to recognize how um, the notion that I had previously about being successful, so much of it actually lived on my external circumstances. Circumstances were never really testing enough uh, and so I could live with that notion. Um, but when circumstances, and as, uh, as Bipin quoted Wayne Dyer, when, when you're really squeezed, <laughs> that's when the true, true test of what we carry actually shows up. Um, and um, I think if we are not prepared to look, then we will resist. And when we resist, it takes even longer for us to actually discover. So the, the idea of developing the self-awareness muscle is the, um, is the habit of taking note um, as soon as an identity is confronted, um, then looking inside and being able to go inside and see, okay, what am I not seeing here? I really like what Hari Prasad um, uh, says, what am I not seeing? Um, what am I not seeing? Living, your, living our life with the, with, the, with the spirit of what am I not seeing? Again, going back to that discovery and learning. Uh, that, is the, that is the mindset that we need to be trained for and, and, and adopt. We all want to feel free, right? But if we can't talk about things and we can't, it starts with being able to look at them in ourselves, how can we be free? I mean, it's so simple we are avoiding so much. And we know what it's like to be in the room with somebody who's avoidant, who's avoiding the issue or avoiding the quality that is causing a block in the relationship. We, we know this so well. Let us not be that person. Let us not be the person who causes the block in ourselves and in our relationships. Why not have a little courage to look within and see my insecurities and be able to speak about them. Why do we need to avoid that? It's so freeing when we can look at what we're afraid of and actually be accepted and, and create an environment, a culture where it, it is all right and you're accepted fairly unconditionally. Now, there are always conditions in terms of what is appropriate. But when we expand the scope of what's appropriate to include our humanity and our insecurities, we create so much more security and people actually overcome insecurities and they flourish and the environment becomes so inspiring and we truly feel free. It's so powerful. We experience this in our work. We experience that with each other by some grace and we experience that at times when we work with teams that are open and receptive and in our workshops that are open for anybody. The, the question, you know, what am I not seeing can feel a little um, nebulous or, or very open at least. Is there, are there other questions that you can think of that might feel a little bit more practical either within the work environment or at home? Um, that might allow a conversation to start or at least to ask for this mirror to reflect back uh, some of the challenges that I might be having. 
I mean, take a, a situation. What am I afraid of in this situation? What am I afraid is going to happen? What am I afraid will be seen about me is a very powerful way of directing it. To me, um, going back to the question about what am I not seeing, that's an invitation for the mirror to actually step in, right? Um, so if uh, it does take uh, that complete openness to, uh, and then a dialogue to be able to then arrive at very precisely, what am I not seeing? So what am I not seeing is a mindset uh, that signifies a certain openness for the mirror, whoever that person may be in our lives, whether it's in the context of an intimate relationship or work environment, um, to be able to say, this is what I see that you're not seeing. Because we do need somebody from the outside to be able to show us that. So when um, one of my mentors, uh, he talks about this podcast that he was listening to and uh, in the beginning of the podcast, uh, the, the person who was being interviewed uh, made, a, uh, made a comment about uh, uh, the geography that the, inter the interviewer was living in. And that interviewer corrected the, the, the person being interviewed. And that person being interviewed said, thank you, thank you. I live to be, I live to be corrected. I live to be corrected. And... Uh, uh, my mentor was telling me that 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 phrase, that word, uh, or that that's those set of words, I live to be corrected, uh, really, uh, really struck a chord with him. Uh, because he, he said that if I learn to live life that way, it's such an invitation for me to actually become better and better and better. Now, again, I live to be corrected. If you tell that to people who are very eager to correct you, it can actually be misused. So it has to be applied with some degree of discernment. Uh, but again, what it indicates is a mindset. Um, and when, especially in a few relationships in our life, and we need to have a few relationships in our, in our lives where we can walk into those relationships with that question. Hey, what am I not seeing? Correct me, please. Um, uh, and then we can bring in a situation either in the context of that relationship or, some, or something that happens outside of that relationship to be able to have a conversation about. But that, that phrase indicates a mindset, an invitation for the other person to then um, show us what we're not seeing. I also think that like Michael, you were saying that question when just asked if I'm standing alone and thinking about what am I not seeing it, it can feel very broad and overwhelming, but then taken in a context. So if you and I are co-founders and generally we each think that we are, we trust our instincts and we're right about a lot of things and I see a point of divergence on a decision. How, you know, it's very typical for me to double down and like, well, here's what I am seeing. He here's why I think I'm right. And you're doing the same. And in that moment, am I able to, well, I also really trust Michael. We're, wor we're working so closely together and I'm hearing him, but what else, what am I not seeing in this specific decision that is he's seeing? And even even if he may not be seeing all, what I'm seeing, I can ask, I'm not, I question my own um, righteousness and my own uh, confidence, not to go in a place of like par paralysis and self-doubt, but just to be able to check myself. Um, and I think then, then it becomes very specific. It can be about a decision to hire, to fire. It can be about a decision to, you know, invest in one initiative over another and you can always keep coming back to okay i have clarity on my point of view but what may i not what might i not be seeing um, so then it doesn't feel so broad anymore for me also to your point Vipin, I, I really like what you said about um like not going to that place of like intense self-doubt or complete lack of confidence but to question my confidence <laughs> I need to have a healthy sense of, to me, healthy confidence is yeah. when, when I'm comfortable to question my own confidence. 
Yeah, one of the things that um, Brene Brown says, which I thought was very powerful, is I'm here to get it right, not to be right. Um, and that speaks to just being in that mindset. Yeah. One other thing that was on my mind from a little while earlier, when we were talking about discovery and the excitement of discovery, the thought that came to my mind is that sometimes that discovery can also be like a shiny new thing. So there's excitement at the beginning and then that excitement tails off as you think about, well, what, so now, now what, now the hard work actually begins of how do I make, how, how do I work on that thing that I've discovered? And so there, I think part of the excitement that, I experience is having that strong support network to help you process and keep moving the needle on those things. And I think this comes back to Rasnath, what you were saying earlier about, you know, the idea of an executive team, coach, confidant, like who are those people that can help me who are in my corner, who I can be really open and vulnerable with because it's really hard to do this on, on our own. And it's, so, it's overwhelming. So otherwise you'll be left with a lot of exciting discoveries and, and, and no progress. Although that said, even we talk about with self-awareness and we see this a lot with the Enneagram Institute, any of thoughts of the day, like self-awareness alone can create shifts because we can't keep doing the same thing over and over again when we become truly aware of this insecurity or this tendency of ours and we we also um we've encountered many times and ross and Ath brought this to the fore at one of our uh workshops where we were training people to be coaches or to do coaching at an organization and uh you know the response to getting feedback or, or coming in touch with something which may be helpful for me to learn to see is, yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm aware of that. <laughs> and, and you see in that response is a lack of awareness. Because if I'm truly aware of this, then going back to sort of the beginnings of this conversation, if I'm truly aware of this, there's going to be shame in that. And the fact that you see it and, and you think it's important enough to share with me, whew, that's, that makes me feel shame, 100%. And so the response of, yeah, I'm aware of that is a compensation for that shame. It's a way of dialing it down and saying, I got it under control. Thank you very much. It's like, yeah, no, no news to me. You can't surprise me. It's, it's a way of saying, you can't touch me, right? And we don't even know we're doing it. This is why there's a lack of awareness in that response. If I'm actually aware, how might I respond to that? It would be different, even if it's the same words. Let's, let's for, for the sake of understanding, let's use the same words. Yeah, thank you. I am aware of that. I'm trying to work on that. It feels very different from like, yeah, thank you. I'm aware of that. I'm working on it. And, th and that's what we see all the time. So the thing is, it's humbling. All of this self-work is humbling. And self-awareness means we become more humble because we see more. We see our egos. We see our shadows. We see our insecurities. And instead of them creating more hyped up confidence, which we think the world expects of us and we think we should be, right? It actually grounds us in humility and makes us so honest and so disarming because we can be who we are and we can be so open and not putting on a front, not putting on a mask. And we can invite everybody to be themselves and to feel so free. I and mean, it's incredible when we can do this. It requires humility. But self-awareness will bring that humility if we approach it honestly. And then we can feel free and uplifted rather than skipping all these steps in, in, in a kind of make-believe. We, 
I think this is this brings it back to full, you know full circle where we started uh, talking about how when we are um, when we are caught on self aware it brings up shame and uh, and many times the response like what you're talking about Hari Prasad I'm aware of it is is actually the deflection of that shame um, and I think it's very helpful to to become comfortable with um, with the emotion of shame first because every time we become self-aware there is some element of shame that's going to come up um, as um, and as you said we need to be humble um, and quoting c.s lewis from the problem of pain humiliation comes before humility uh, the journey of discovery um, the excitement is about the discovery but the process of discovery is uncomfortable and um, that's why Self-awareness is a very courageous journey. Um, it is. Uh, uh, it is. It, it truly requires. It's not something that is glamorous. Uh, although the effects of it, when we do become self-aware, can be far-reaching and highly impactful. <laughs> the journey of self-awareness uh, is hard work. It's walking towards the messes. Uh, it's becoming comfortable with with emotions like shame and learning how to talk about them, um, which is why many times the, it's easier to not do the work but to project, uh, because the work demands us demands uh, a certain realness. So uh, the urge here is to is to uh, do a, do less of the projecting and more of the actual work. Because even if we do a little bit of the actual work, the impact of it, both for our lives and for the lives of so many people around us can be far reaching. So when we catch ourselves saying, you know, I'm a pretty self-aware person, hopefully this gives us some more food for thought at the very least. <laughs>